Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast. It's a show filled with family history research strategies and techniques, news and entertainment, and inspiration. And I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello and welcome to Genealogy Gems Podcast, episode number 151. This is Lisa Louise Cook. I'm so glad you're joining me here today. You know, I'm just getting ready to fly over to London to speak at the Who Do You Think You Are live show. But before I do that, I want to get together with you in this episode and talk about all things family history. Now, in this episode, I'm going to bring you little gems that can improve your genealogy research, save you some time and some money, and inspire you to keep pursuing those elusive ancestors. And in this episode, I've actually got 25 gems for you. Uh, it's part two of the gem that we started in the last episode. It's called 50 Fabulous Family History Favorites. And that's coming up in just a little bit. This last weekend, I had a grand old time. On Friday, I babysat my two grandsons, Davy and Joey, and I put together a little game that was prompted by a listener email. Now, you met longtime listener and premium member Dot, who lives in Australia during our virtual Christmas party, which was uh, episode 147. And after that show aired, Dot wrote to me to say how much she enjoyed it and to tell me a little bit about a concentration game that she put together for her granddaughter. Now, when my kids were growing up, we called these games uh, like the memory game. And I know some folks call it match game, but uh, no matter what you call it, the game is where you have a set of cards and they're all pairs and you lay them, you know, face down in rows on the table and two at a time, you turn them over trying to find matches. And the person, of course, with the most matches at the end of the game wins. Well, Dot made up some cards with photographs of her family members on them. And she uh, wrote me about how her little granddaughter responded. She says she opened the little box I was holding and went through the photos one by one. We put a few pairs down at a time. And as she turned them over, she matched them. I included our pets as well. Well, I thought this was really neat. And I wrote back to Dot and I let her know that uh, I think myheritage.com had something similar to that on their website. Uh, you have to sign in for their free account at myheritage.com. But in the menu, you'll find the My Heritage Family Game under the Apps tab. So you can even play this kind of a game online. Well, when Davey, who is three years old, arrived on Friday, of course, I was babysitting, I got to thinking about all this, and I quickly whipped together a set of cards using both current day pictures of family members and photographs of ancestors. It was pretty easy to do it. I did it in Publisher, in Microsoft Publisher. I started a blank page, and I created one little rectangle outline shape that would be the size of the card that I wanted. And then I could just uh, copy and paste that shape all over the page to, to kind of fill it up. I think I ended up with about six cards per page. And then I could just duplicate the page enough times to have enough cards for a whole game. So I just started with nine pairs, so Davey would kind of get the hang of it. And uh, then using the insert picture feature on Microsoft Publisher, I just filled in each rectangle with a photograph of my computer. And the rectangle made it really easy because, of course, every photograph was a little different size. But I could just grab the edge, resize it to fit inside the rectangle, and I could be sure that all my cards were uniform. So I printed them out on photo paper, I cut them into little cards, and um, we sat down, we gave it a spin. And as he turned over each card, I called out, of course, who it was, and he really liked uh, my cowboy-looking great-grandfather, William Moore. And uh, there was also a picture of my grandfather with his father and my uncle, and well, on the trains, where he, he used to work as a train conductor. So you can head to the show notes for this episode, which is 151, to take a look at my little set of ancestor memory cards. It was a lot of fun and a great way to incorporate family history into daily activities. I want to thank Dot for prompting that wonderful idea. It was a lot of fun and a great way to incorporate family history into daily activities. And I think that when we do that, it really makes family history more, just more of a natural part of our kids' lives. So I want to thank Dot in Australia for prompting that little project. It was a lot of fun. 
And Dot also mentioned to me when she wrote that she found an app for her iPad. It's called Match, and it lets you um, use your own photos but create basically a match game on the iPad. It's by Apps Kids Love, and I'll have a link in the show notes for you that uh, takes you right to it. This is a really fun app, and if you set up a folder, here's the key, set up a folder of ancestor photos, say on Flickr or in your camera roll, if you have a separate grouping of these ancestor photos, it makes it really easy to bring them all in and, and populate the game. And the other fun thing, kind of with a game theme uh, I did this weekend was watch a movie called Play the Game. Now, my daughter Hannah had told me about this, and she set it up in my Netflix instant queue uh, when she was here over the holidays, and we finally got a chance to sit down and watch it. If you are looking for a Valentine's movie to watch with your sweetie, this is it. Um, it's a little independent film from about 2008, and it's starring one of my all-time favorite actors, Andy Griffith. Don't you just love him? He just passed away, I think, in the last year or so. Well, he's in this movie. He's absolutely adorable. It's about the relationship between a young man, kind of in his uh, late 20s, and his grandfather, and how they kind of coach each other through their love lives. It's it's funny, and it's sweet, and, and that in itself is very refreshing. So you can check it out at the movie's website. It's called playthegamemovie.com. And finally... Well, you know, it is the week of Valentine's. I'm not exactly sure if this episode is going to be out right before or right after, but uh, if you're still in the mood to show the love uh, and you've enjoyed any of my books or the podcast or the Genealogy Gems app uh, or the website, how about showing your love by casting your vote? Okay, what's going on is uh, about.com, which is a blog that uh, Kimberly Powell does for about.com, which is a very popular website. They're having the 2013 About Genealogy Reader's Choice Awards. And this is open for nominations in a variety of categories. They've got genealogy software and apps. So, of course, we kind of fall in that category uh, to websites and blogs and books. So I'll have a link in the show notes for you. You can click on the links um, to nominate your favorite website. And uh, nominations for the awards are open until February 17th, 2013. So this is right around the corner. You have to kind of jump on it. <laughs> but if you uh, would love to spread the love about Genealogy Gems, I just think that would be wonderful. Thank you so much. All right. Well, coming up right after this, I've got the rest of our 50 fabulous family history favorites for you. I've got some great news for all you genealogists out there. Roots Magic 6 is now available and it offers some of the most customer requested features like online publishing, the ability to search every record, not just people, an editable timeline view, which is really incredible, and new web tags, which lets you link people, sources, places, and research log items to web pages, plus dozens of other great enhancements, and of course, all the built-in features that you've come to enjoy. There is a little something here for everyone. Now, if you're already a devoted Roots Magic user like I am, or if you're looking to take the next step in your family history research and finally start recording your family tree in your own genealogy database, or if you've just been wanting to make a switch to a much more user-friendly program, there's no better time to get your copy of Roots Magic 6. Do it now. Go to RootsMagic.com and download your risk-free trial of Roots Magic 6. You'll see why professionals and beginners alike choose Roots Magic at RootsMagic.com.
podcast episode number 150. We were kind of celebrating the 150th episode and my 50th birthday, which (laughs) we don't have to mention as often, but doing a little celebrating and talking about my 50 family history favorites. And we're going to finish up that list, round it out, starting with number 26. And this first section of gems that I want to talk to you about fall under the category of free charts. Now, genealogy charts in one form or another have been around since people started keeping track of their family history. And even with all the technology we have today, sometimes there is really just no substitute for a paper chart to kind of help you work through the complicated relationships in your family tree. My first favorite gems are in this chart category, free charts that you can use online, and offline to help you keep things organized, as well as help you share your family history with other people. Um, number 26 in our list as we resume our 50 list is about genealogy. Now it's at genealogy.about.com. And in fact, they were the ones running the contest I just told you about. At about.com and the genealogy blog, you can view, download, save, and print family tree charts and forms, including the U.S. Census extraction forms. In this collection, you will find traditional family trees that are suitable for printing, as well as some interactive charts that allow you to type into the fields right online. So if you don't want to print it out, you can use the Adobe Reader program and you can type right into the forms and then just save them to your computer. Number 27 is Ancestry.com. Now, we don't often think of Ancestry as a place for charts. It's more of a place for records. But deep in the Ancestry website are a diverse collection of free downloadable forms and charts. You can select from the Ancestry Ancestral Form, the Research Calendar, Research Extract, Correspondence Record, Family Group Sheet, Source Summary, and they've got U.S., U.K., and Canadian Census Forms. And as I said, they are kind of buried deep in the website. So again, you'll want to head to the show notes because I've got the link that will take you directly there. Favorite number 28 comes from Family Tree Magazine at familytreemagazine.com slash free forms. Now they offer a wide selection of free downloadable charts, including a five generation ancestor chart, family group sheet, a research calendar, and a repository checklist. You'll also find forms for cemetery transcription, immigration records, oral history, heirlooms, and uh, census extraction forms from each of the U.S. enumerations. And the kids in your life are going to love having their own set of family history sleuthing tools, which you can find at Family Tree Kids. That's at kids.familytreemagazine.com. Number 29 comes from outside the genealogy world. And uh, in addition to functional charts, there's also some wonderful decorative options that you can use to display your findings. Number 29 is MarthaStewart.com. Now, at MarthaStewart.com, they offer an online decorative family tree fan chart template that is suitable for framing. And in the search box on the website, uh, on the homepage, just search for family tree charts. And you're going to find several lovely charts in the results list that include instructions and downloadable templates. And you'll also find um, some other things, that, the good things that she talks about, including some free videos and uh, some family tree display ideas, which are really terrific. And number 30 is familychartmasters.com. The Family Chart Masters chart creation tool, which they have on the Family Chartist website, it's a great way to make a decorative 8.5 by 11 chart for free, suitable for scrapbooking, framing, or other craft projects. All you have to do is enter your information manually or via the GEDCOM. You can you know, upload your GEDCOM and you choose one of the simple pedigree chart designs. You can edit your information and then you can choose from hundreds of borders, backgrounds, embellishments, and uh, even use your own pictures in your chart if you want to. It's a great way to test run what a larger chart might look like, but also to have a small one that you could uh, stick in a scrapbook or frame and give to someone in your family. Now, you can tell by the way I open this show that I love a good movie, and I particularly love movies with family history themes, and I love stories of immigration. So this next group of favorites are what I consider to be really some of the best movies I've come across over the years. Number 31 is called Full of Life. The movie's about a writer 
His name is Nick and his wife, Emily. Now, Emily is played by the wonderful Judy Holiday. You'll remember her from Born Yesterday. And Richard Conti plays Nick. And they're expecting their first child. But when a necessary home repair proves a little too costly to afford, Nick has to swallow his pride and uh, visit with his father, who's a proud immigrant stonemason, with whom he has a very difficult relationship, and he has to ask him to do the work. And in the movie, they have to kind of confront the issues of religious and family tradition, which have separated the father and the son. And it causes Nick and Emily to reevaluate their lives and the things that they value most. It is a touching, touching movie, uh, black and white. It's a wonderful date night movie. And again, that's called Full of Life. And the last time I caught it, it was on Turner Classic Movie. So that might be a place to look for it. But do a quick Google search and you might find um, if it's included in other services like Netflix or those types of places. Favorite number 32 is Sweetland. Ah, you probably remember me talking about the movie Sweetland in episode number 30. And I actually have a YouTube video on this as well. This movie was directed by Ali Salim, who was a guest here on the show. And here's kind of a synopsis of the of what the story is about. There's a character, a young man named Lars Torvik. His grandmother, Inga, dies in 2004. And he's faced with a decision whether to sell the family farm on which she lived since 1920 or cling to the legacy of the land. And seeking advice, he turns to the memory of Inga and the stories that she passes on to him. The bulk of the movie goes back to 1920 in Minnesota when a young Norwegian farmer named Olaf brings Inga over, but she's German in heritage, and she lacks official immigration papers. So it kind of makes her an object of suspicion in this small town that they live in, and she and Olaf are forbidden to marry. So she's kind of alone and adrift, and she goes to live with the family of Olaf's friends, his neighbor Franson and, and his wife Brownie. And then there, while she's living with them, she learns English and American ways and kind of wins her independence. The movie is based on Will Weaver's short story. It was called A Gravestone Made of Wheat, and it was all shot beautifully in southern Minnesota. And there's lots of stars you're going to recognize in this movie, Ned Beatty and Paul Sand. It's really wonderfully, wonderfully done. And again, if you want to hear kind of the background story on it, check out episode number 30 in my interview with Ali Salim, the movie's director. Number 33 The Immigrants, starring Max von Sydow. Now, I talked about this, uh, well, I actually talked about the book, I think it was, in episode number 24. Um, But there's also a movie that was done. It's a 1971 Swedish film, and it tells the story of a Swedish group who immigrate from Sweden to Minnesota in the 19th century. The film, as I said, is based on two novels of The Immigrants' Suite. It's by Wilhelm Moberg. The Immigrants, and the other one was called Unto a Good Land. And it stars Liv Ullman, Max von Sydow, really beautifully done and just riveting. If you want to really kind of move at a slow pace and really take in that immigrant experience, this is the movie for you. Again, it might be a little more challenging to find. Uh, Look for it online. It might be on DVD. And, of course, Turner Classic Movies is also a good uh, resource for that. And number 34, wrapping up the movie section here, is America, America. I just came across this movie. I think it was last year. It was on Turner Classic Movies. It's from 1963. And uh, it was produced and written by Elia Kazan. And it's from his own book. So this is really coming from his family history. The movie is kind of loosely based on the life of Elia Kazan's uncle and how he immigrates from Greece over to America. It's full of really little known cast members. Uh, the actors themselves weren't really the feature. It was that this riveting story of hardship and struggles and immigration. And it is captivating. One of the things that is so captivating about this movie is the music. In fact, after I watched it, I went onto eBay and I actually bought an old LP. Does anybody even use LPs anymore? (laughs) I got a hold of an old LP because I have one of those turntables that will digitize the music for you. But this background music is absolutely haunting and and just absolutely perfect for this 
movie. And it, it really is a, a wonderful story. Kind of a long movie. As I recall, it's about nearly three hours. So get ready for a full evening. But uh, it's called America, America. And I think in Britain, it was under the title, The Anatolian Smile. Again, this is from 1963. Well, one question I get asked a lot is about conferences. And most folks don't have the time or the money, of course, to attend them all. And so I often get asked, hey, if I could go to just one conference, which one would it be? Well, first and foremost, it's the one that has the kind of classes you're looking for, right? That's the one that you really want to go to. But I do have some recommendations for conferences that I really think that you can't go wrong with. So favorite number 35 the Southern California Genealogical Society Jamboree. You'll find them at scgsgenealogy.com. This is the annual conference held in Burbank, California. And even if you're not from the West Coast, this is worth the trip. It's a huge conference. They probably get upwards of 1,800 people total over the span of the conference who attend. And I have to say, it's probably the one of the most friendly, energetic party <laughs> genealogy conferences there is. And I mean party as in everybody's just so happy to be there. And they're so welcoming. And it's fun. I, and I think that really is emanated from the organizers themselves, Leo and Paula, they put this together. And, and they are such, such fun people. And it really radiates down throughout the whole conference and all of the events and, and every year has a new little twist to it. So Certainly, it's it's one that I don't miss. I've been there the, probably the last at least five years or so. But it's a ton of fun. Great speakers they attract. And so, again, well worth your time. Number 36 would be Family Search's Roots Tech Conference in Salt Lake City. It's coming up. It's going to be in March of 2013 this year. And Roots Tech really came on the scene with a bang, and it just never let down. They put a lot of money into this conference, and it really shows. And I have to say, it's pretty exciting because you go into that exhibit hall, and there's just no other hall like it. And it really has the the feel of a high-tech, high-end conference. But again, great quality speakers, presentations, and just all kinds of really fun events they have on the off hours around the conference as well. So that's the Roots Tech Conference. You'll find that at rootstech.org. Number 37 is the Mesa Family History Expo. Now, Family History Expos are conducted in several states across the country, but the Mesa, Arizona one, I think in particular, really stands out. I've been to it the last several years, and it just it's like coming to old home week, you know, lots and lots of great activities, classes, um, energy. And, and I think that a lot of the folks there are just so warm and friendly that if you're a first timer and maybe you're a little bit shy, this is a wonderful place to go because like I say, everybody is so welcoming and it's a really easy facility to get around uh, the conventions that are there. And of course, you can't go wrong with all that sunshine in Arizona in the winter time. Uh, typically, the Mesa Family History Expo is held in January each year. So you can look for that at familyhistoryexpo.com. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the Who Do You Think You Are live conference in London. Uh, absolutely one of my favorites. This is my third year going and speaking at the conference. And um, even though Roots Tech does a really high-end exhibit hall, I think that the Who Do You Think You Are live conference just does the biggest one, don't you think? <laughs> it is huge. And I have heard numbers upwards of 17,000 people attending that conference over the uh, multi-day, usually it's a long weekend time frame. You'll find classes put on by the Society of Genealogists over there in England, and they put on wonderful programs with top-notch speakers, but it really is the exhibit hall that just stands out. Loads and loads of um, the various counties have, the societies have their booths there. So you really get a chance to talk to people who know individual counties and the records in those areas and have all kinds of reference materials and resources. It's just tremendous. And then there's lots of vendors and some of them put on quite theatrical booths. <laughs> and some of them, like Find My Past, even conducts classes within their exhibit area. So it is just absolutely not to be missed. I've got a quick little overview of one of my um, tours of the Who Do You Think You Are live conference that's on YouTube in a video, so I'll have that for you in the show notes. 
and you'll find more information at whodoyouthinkyouarelive.com. And rounding out at number 39 in the conference and events section is a Canadian conference, the Alberta Genealogical Society Conference. I think this one really stands out so well organized and so many fascinating classes, a really great variety, both for Canadians and those from uh, outside, as in the U.S. And, and Britain. Alberta puts on a wonderful conference, typically in April of each year. And the location can vary, but I really think that the the quality of the presentations, the banquets, uh, the energy, the classes, the, the number of people, and truly the, the really top-notch organization. And I think that's one of the things that runs throughout all of my recommendations is it takes really good organization and forethought and attention to detail to make a really wonderful conference experience. And uh, that makes it a lot easier on you, particularly if it's your first time out. So if you're up in Canada, check out the Alberta Genealogical Society Conference. Uh, each province has a major conference, but this one um, I really stands out in my book. Now, every day that we invest in genealogy research, it becomes even more important that we capture the interest of the next generation in family history. Because if we don't, it could all be lost and be for nothing. So this next group of faves are tools that you can use to accomplish this important task. Favorite number 40 is Disney's The Tigger Movie. Now, you can capture your kids' attention and imagination with three different Winnie the Pooh-inspired family trees at this website. These are colorful and whimsical charts, and they're perfect for printing and for framing. And they really bring your child's family history to their bedroom wall or right smack on the refrigerator door. <laughs> You'll find it at Disney.go.com, and I'll have the specific link to get you to the family tree section of Disney's Tigger Movies website. Next up, I think I touched on it before, was Family Tree Kids. This is kids.familytreemagazine.com. If your kids are working on a school project about family history or wondering if they're related to a princess or a Viking, or maybe they just heard stories about um, a Civil War soldier in your family, this is the place for you guys to go. Family Tree Kids is a site where kids can learn to become a family detective and dig up clues about their ancestry. There are games and activities that were created just for kids. None of that boring grown-up stuff. They could have a ton of fun here tracing their family roots. I love how the site inspires kids to be a family detective. It's kind of a fun way for kids to imagine themselves and kind of the role they might play in their family history. In that area of the website, they have a scavenger hunt where you explore grandma's attic, information about how to interview a relative, just like a detective, uh, tour a cemetery, create a time capsule, all kinds of fun stuff. Who wouldn't enjoy that? It is uh, Family Tree Magazine Kids. And number 42 is Zap the Grandma Gap. This is probably one of the newest websites out there, and it's all based around a book that recently was published by Janet Havorka. Janet is a good friend of mine, and she is the owner of Family Chart Masters, but she has put together a book that really comes from her heart, something I know that she's been talking about for the last year or so, and it's just all gelled together in this book about how to bridge the generation gap with your kids and your grandkids. Now, it's called Zap the Grandma Gap, but it's for grandpas too and for aunts and for uncles and <laughs> anybody who is a genealogist in the family who would like to harness the tools they have to inspire and captivate the kids in their lives. And there are some great resources available for free on the website. There's downloads, there's charts, uh, ways to connect, all kinds of great information. It's zapthegrandmagap.com. And number 43 in the area of involving kids comes from my Pinterest account. <laughs> if you're not on Pinterest, you might want to check it out. It is a lot of fun. And more and more, I find myself using it in regards to my family history. Now it's Pinterest.com. I'll spell it for you. P-I-N-T-E-R-E-S-T.com. And what you can do is create a board, uh, a virtual board online on the website where you can then 
find items while you're searching around online and you can pin them to your board so that you can remember them, be inspired by them, refer back to them and share them with other people. I've created a board all about family history and kids, and you're just going to have to go check it out. Okay, so this will be a good impetus to get you um, to check out Pinterest, see how much fun people are having out there. And um, in addition to my kids family history board, I also have craft projects that are family history themed and some of my favorite experts and interviews I've conducted, all kinds of things collected in these boards. And if you see something you like, you click on it, it takes you through to a particular website with more information. So check it out. Okay, you'll find it at pinterest.com slash Lisa Louise Cook. And I will have a link that takes you directly to my genealogy for kids board on my area of Pinterest. And finally, I'm because we're celebrating 150 episodes of the Genealogy Gems podcast, I want to wrap this up with some of my favorite episodes. I, I get asked this a lot. Which ones are your favorites? What are your first, your favorite interviews and that kind of thing? And it's really hard to pick. But I do have um, some that I know would fall in this top category. Number 44 was my interview with the forensic linguist, Dr. Robert Leonard. If you want to check that out, it's episodes 89 and 90. I could have talked to him for 10 episodes. <laughs> I just never got tired of it. And He's a fascinating man. He, he works in forensic linguistics, and he's oftentimes a professional witness on the witness stand for high-profile murder cases. So a really interesting guy with a personal passion for family history, and that was a lot of fun. So check it out, episodes 89 and 90. Number 45 would have to be my interview with the band Venice. These are the guys that are the cousins of the Lennon sisters. And they are from, indeed, Venice, California. And I had an opportunity to do some research for them on the family and then get a chance to meet with them backstage and share my findings sitting on their concert. They're just really great guys and a fascinating family history. You just you got to hear them. Um, that's in episode number 38. Favorite number 46, uh, it's got to be my interview with Lisa Kudrow. That's from episode 81. And that was my first time around getting a chance to chat with her. My gosh, the gal is so busy, has so many different projects going. She spent a half an hour with me on the phone. Uh, really lovely lady and just so passionate about producing and starring in her TV series, Who Do You Think You Are for NBC TV. And the good news is, even though it got canceled from NBC, Word is on the street that it is getting picked up by another cable channel. So stay tuned. We're hoping that there are going to be more episodes of Who Do You Think You Are here in the U.S. Wouldn't that be fantastic? Number 47 is episode 91. Now, this was a live production of Genealogy Gems podcast that we did at the Southern California Genealogical Society Jamboree in Burbank, California. Among my guests was Chris Haley. He's the nephew of Alex Haley, the author of Roots, uh, but a very accomplished young man himself. But what I loved about that episode was he just spontaneously burst into song, and it really caught me by surprise. But what a wonderful treat. You can hear him singing in episode 91. And number 48, it's really two episodes, but it's one interview. Steve Luxenberg. He wrote Annie's Ghost. And... What a wonderful, again, I could have spent 10 episodes with it, Steve. It was just amazing. And in fact, we got together at the Jamboree uh, in 2012, and we did a, a live interview. In fact, a kind of a meet the author type of presentation. He taught a lot of classes there at Jamboree. But he's just a really thoughtful guy who just did a tremendous amount of research in putting that book together. I highly recommend the book, Annie's Ghost. And uh, if you haven't caught that interview, I think that you'll be very inspired. And particularly, there are so many people whose lives were affected by ancestors uh, who were put away for one reason or another in asylums. And for various reasons, probably wouldn't be put away today if, if it were the same circumstances. And yet the records are kept so tightly held and secret that it's a real challenge for researchers. But boy, he sure met the challenge. Number 49 would, um, would have to be my interview with Gina Philibert Ortega. Because, one, I just love Gina. She's a really, really nice gal. And I love her book about family history and cooking and food. And talking about tracing female ancestors, which is 
definitely of interest to all of us and presents some unique challenges. And Gina always has great ideas about that. So you can check out my interview with Gina in episodes 137 and 138. And of course, our video interview, which is on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash genealogy gems. And you'll find it under the family, I think it's family history and food playlist. Uh, we did two videos there. And number 50, and probably this is one of my all time favorite episodes was episode number 39. Uh, it's about heritage quilts. And it was uh, an opportunity that I took to tell the story about an old quilt that my great grandmother had made many years ago, back in the 1920s or 30s, and how I came to inherit it. Um, it's just a, a personal story from my family history and modern day history as well. And I really enjoyed sharing that with all of you. So that's episode number 39. And, and who doesn't love a vintage quilt? It certainly is one of my favorite things. So there you have it. My top 50 fabulous family history favorites. I hope there are some gems in there that you're going to find of interest and be able to chase down and, and maybe have some successes with. I hope you've enjoyed this 50 list over these last two episodes. It's been a lot of fun to put together. And we'll have to do some things like this again in the future. And of course, I love hearing about your favorites. So drop me a line, genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com, or you can leave a voicemail on the voicemail line, joining me for this genealogy gems podcast episode number 151. And before I let you go, I wanted to uh, let you know that there was a, an article recently in the Deseret News in Utah at deseretnews.com that was titled Technology Making Genealogy Easier. And uh, I did a little telephone interview with this guy and my gosh, it seemed like the whole article <laughs> ended up being talking about what we do here at Genealogy Gems. So I'll have a link in the show notes so you can check that out. And also wanted to let you know, I am going to be speaking at the Southern California Genealogical Society Jamboree, as I mentioned, and I have just signed on to moderate their banquet. The Friday night banquet is going to be exciting. It is going to be behind the scenes of who do you think you are? As I mentioned, this television series here in the U.S. is getting picked up by another cable network, and we're going to talk to some of the researchers who work behind the scenes and putting that all together. It's going to be a wonderful event. Be sure and register soon. Early bird registration is going to be ending here soon. And um, it is a good time for all genealogists. And hope to see you at the banquet as well. And of course, I'll be in the exhibit hall at my booth again this year. Come by and say hi. All right. Well, thank you so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon.